거룩하고 존귀하 Holy living Father God, thank you for your grace and your love from the bottom of our hearts at this time. Father, you have called your people who love your word on this Wednesday service. You have allowed us to praise you and to glorify you. We thank you for giving us this grace. Father God, through our true state of worship today, we seek to lift up to you a worship that is overflowing with gratitude. Father, please help this worship service to be one in which you exhibit joy. Father, at this time, this History of Redemption Academy that you have given to us, this Book 3 graduation, we want to lift all of the glory to you. May it be a graceful time in which you are here with us. May it be a time in which we are able to show to you all of our fruit that we have accumulated over the course of this study. Father God, all of our... From the beginning of our service until the end, all the certificates and all the presentations, may you please be with each and every person. Father, especially this Saturday, Sam Kim and Tabitha Park will be, will be wed before you. Father God, may this be a wedding ceremony that you have prepared. May they be a holy family before you. Father, may, be, may they be a precious family which you are able to use and to further advance your will in this world. Please bless them. And Father, there are many people that are sick and hurting at this time. Please seek each and every one of them, especially Elder David Park, Elders Kwan, Dino, Angela, and Dwayne. Father, all these people, please be with them. And may they come to a full and complete recovery. May they receive new uh, strength and may they soar like wings of eagles. And may they be able to come to a place to worship you and to protect their country even stronger than before. Father, at this time, from the beginning of the, until the end of today's service, in all aspects we entrust unto you. Father, we thank you in all things, and we pray and ask all this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Happy to see everybody. Now everyone's expressions are kind of anxious. And it'll be a time, in, by God's grace, in, in which to show and display your knowledge of how much you've studied. So please, uh, the questions, will they come out to today's lectures? Yes, it will. So please uh, pay attention well, and we will wrap up Book 3 of the Redemptive History series. Now, this is the last lecture of the third book, and today we'll talk about Part 2 and 3 of the Course of David's Refuge. And our main verse will be Psalm chapter 31, verses 15 to 16, and I will read. Because my times are in your hand, rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant, save me in your faithfulness. And this is the word of God. Amen. Through this verse, uh, the reason I chose this as the main verse is that this kind of concludes all of David's life. And the conclusion is that all of his life is in God's hand. You know, when he killed Goliath, he got a lot of praises, right? Saul kills the hundreds and David kills the ten thousands. Or Saul kills the thousands, I'm sorry. And so now, presently, he's living as a refuge in the wilderness. However, the future, he is to be a king of Israel and glorify God. And so this was the course of David's life. But in all, through all the ups and downs of David's life, David did his best to understand that it was God's providence and will. And thus he is able to come to the conclusion of faith that his times were in God's hand. So that is written on our main verse today. So let us think about this state of David's heart as we study the final lecture. 
Now the blue areas, this is the second stage of David's refuge, and the brown or the red ones, that is the third stage. So the second stage begins with Kayla going to the ninth refuge, wilderness of Ziph, and tenth is wilderness of Maon, eleventh is wilderness of Engedi, twelfth is the wilderness of Paran. And from here he goes up to thirteen, which is Carmel. And then 14th, he goes to Zip. And so the 15th place is Gath. And then from here, he goes to Ziklag. So today, we're going to talk about these two stages in David's life of refuge. So let's take a look first at stage two, from Kayla to the wilderness of Zip. And this is roughly three years. Now, there must be some characteristic of each stage, right? And so for the second stage, all of the places in which David took refuge during the second stage were in the wilderness. Except for Kayla. Now, this is the characteristic of the second stage of David's life of refuge. It was in the wilderness. It was a place where you never knew when a beast will attack you or eat you. And it was here that David had to endure extreme suffering and countless bouts of despair in the terrifying and desolate wilderness. So as we think about this, let's go further in. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 32.10. He found him a desert land and in the howling wasteland of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the apple of his eye. So he encircled him, cared for him, guarded him, right? And this is the God that is with us. And here, uh, encircled him, encircle is sabab. It means to encircle or to surround and this is the same word used in the repetition of the Ezekiel's temple, Sabib Sabib. So Sabib comes from Sabab. And so Sabib Sabib is God's, uh, you know, his protection, full protection that kind of surrounds you. So this blessing was given to David in the wilderness. So he believed in that and he was able to overcome all these areas in the wilderness. So we too, we might be in the wilderness and we might feel in despair. But remember, God is always encircling us. His protection is always upon us. So please believe that and understand it. Because that was David's life of refuge. Now let's go straight into it. Number eight, Kayla. And it means fortress or strategic, strategic place. All right, God will be our fortress in the wilderness. And what happened here was that when David heard that the Philistines had invaded Kela in Judah to plunder food, he first asked God in prayer and received an answer. So there are people that came to invade God's people, and God and David prays to God. He asks, should I go to Kela? And God answers him and says, yes, go to Kela and liberate the people. But the people around David, they were thinking, oh, we're too weak. The Philistines are too strong for us to fight them. If we fight them now, then we're going to be too much of a minus. We cannot go forth. They, t they said this to David. And so David, he, he asked God again, God, what is your will? 
And so God always asked God, or David always asked God in prayer. And he always received an, a sure answer. And so God finally said, go and destroy the Philistines. David believed in this fervently. And so thus he attacked and defeated the Philistine army despite the dissuasion of those around him. So it is not the thoughts of man that it must rest on, but only God's answer. Psalm 18.2 The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my Savior, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So we are once again seeing this through David's life. That God is that stronghold, that protection, that fortress. And so with this victory, people no longer view David as a fugitive. Right? David up until thus far has been a fugitive. He's been on the run. But from this victory, he is no longer viewed in a negative light. But instead, the people began to recognize him as the savior and leader of Israel. And that is what happened in Kela. Now, the Israelites should have understood this, and the people in Kela should have continued to believe in David and understand who he was, but they were too much afraid of King Saul. And so David packs up and he goes to the ninth place of refuge, which is called the Wilderness of Ziph. And this means dissolve. You know, when you smelt something, it separates the pure metal with the impure metal. And so David was going to the place where he's dissolved so to be separated in a sense. And when you look here, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14, David stayed in the wilderness of the strongholds and remained in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. So Saul was seeking David every single day in order to kill him. But God, it says here, God did not hand him over to him. Saul endeavored every single day to kill David, but in the end, David was never able to be into his hands. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. So, the Lord who has redeemed us, we must have this zeal to do good things. But at the same time, we have this desire to do good deeds. There are also things that cause us to be going down the path of evil deeds. For example, Saul, he kept on chasing David. We must have a good zeal towards God. And David's zeal overcame his zeal for evil deeds, his zeal for good deeds. And so David, at the wilderness of Ziph, he met Jonathan for the last time, and Jonathan assured him that Saul would never kill David and that David would become king. What a great friend, right? His friend is in such a difficult time. And he, he comforts him and assures him that God has promised this to you. You must have this image amongst congregation members. And so this happened at the wilderness of Ziph. And next we have the wilderness of Maon. And this means residing habitation. And so, we must always realize we must always reside in God. And so when Saul learned that David was in the wilderness of Maon, he chased after him. But Saul's army had to retreat because they had heard that the Philistines had attacked. So, it was a very miraculous turn of events. 
Saul hears that David is in the wilderness of Maon, he goes there to seeking to kill him. But then he finds that a report says that the Philistines had invaded and attacked Israel. So just like the previous refuge per, uh, place, God did not place David into the hands of Saul. David, who had a zeal to do God's good deeds, that zeal enabled him to be protected by God's grace at all times. Now, number 11, we'll go to the wilderness of En Gedi. And this means spring of the young goat. So no matter what kind of place that we're in, the, the most important thing is water. And so here we see that it's a spring, a spring of the young goat. So water was given to David. In other words, David was always protected and looked after. Now, David, I'm sorry, Saul takes with him 3,000 people in order to kill David. But because he was in a haste, he ends up camping in a cave within the wilderness of Engedi. So he's, you know, in order to rest, you have to take out all your uh, military attire and your weapons. And at that time, David was actually in the cave. Now, it was his opportunity to kill Saul. However... He did not kill him and only cut off the edge of his robe. Why? It's because David did not touch the fact that Saul was anointed by God himself. And so Saul's life, Saul becoming king, all of that is within God's hand. It is not something that David can decide with his own mind or his own body. So truly we see that David's faith is always centered around God. And because it was centered around God, he did not take his own revenge. So Proverbs chapter 16 verse 7 it says, when a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he causes even his enemies to make peace with him. So because his goodness, it allows the person's enemies to make peace with him. So David's image was very, very joyous before God. And Saul actually comes to repentance. You know, this is a guy that's been trying to kill David for the past many, many years. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 16 to 17, so Saul finds out that David could have killed him, but instead David cut off just an edge of his robe. And so Saul's reply is this. When Saul said, when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And he says, you are more righteous than I. I am trying to kill you this entire time, yet you had your opportunity, but you didn't take it. You are more righteous than I. So this good deed, this good nature of man, it allows even our enemies to turn back and return to God. So this is the kind of image that we must have. Now, the reason why this happened was because the image of David entrusting judgment to God and desiring to overcome evil with good calls to mind Jesus Christ, who entrusted everything to God and walked the way of the cross silently through the jeering and the mockery. So Jesus, Jesus Christ, who went through all of that suffering... So we can see this foreshadowing of Jesus through the life of David here. So we too, at all times, 
you know, there's some times when the evil and the good is fighting within us. It's a little weird or we feel down. But truly, it is when we see the image of Jesus and the image of David, when we see, ah, good will always win. We must hold on to the good. So please have this sort of love for each other. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 when the path to the cross was so difficult for Jesus, he says this, uh, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he ends the prayer with, Yet not as I will, but as you will. So again, we see a true God-centered life within Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So when we go upon the path of the cross, it's always patience and endurance. And as we walk that path, there must be so many things that happen, right? So many things that try to distract us. But we must remember, God helps us along that path. Now, 12, the wilderness of Paran. This is a land with many caves. So David was greatly shocked by the news that prophet Samuel, who was like his spiritual father, had passed away. So he went down to the wilderness of Paran, a land far to the south. So Saul, if he find out that Samuel's dead, he'll try to persecute David even more. And so David goes to Carmel. And this place means vineyard or orchard. And David returned from the wilderness of Paran to Carmel in Maon and sought help from a rich man named Nabal. However, Nabal... He was a very evil person. And so he he persecutes David and insults David and he rejects his help. And so David says in 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 21 The only reason he has this richness, his wealth is because I and my men protected him in the wilderness, but I should not have done so. This guy returned me evil for good. And so David takes 400 people, and it was at this time that Abigail came before David, who led 400 soldiers to Carmel to kill Nabal, and appeased David's anger and prevented him from taking revenge by shedding blood with his own hands. Now, Abigail, she prostrates herself before David, and she pleads for him. You, there's no need for you to go to that worthless Nabal. And so David sees this Abigail, and he realizes, ah, this is a very wife, a wise woman. So Abigail, she wanted to tell David that he is always in that bundle of God's protection. He, she said that he is wrapped in the bundle of the living and that God is with him. And she gives him courage once more. However, Nabal was a spiritually blind person who paid the grace he received with insults. So Abigail was a woman with redemptive historical perspective and insight who knew that David would become king. If you look at the two names and their meanings, Abigail means joy of my father. It's my father's happy. But Nabal means tasteless. So 
So clearly there's a distinction. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. So Abigail, she became a person that eventually became the wife of David. So we must always have the taste of God's redemptive history and take that food and go out to all kinds of people. And then the 14th place of refuge. This is the last place of the second place of refuge, the second period. Now, in the middle of the night, God caused Saul to sleep a very deep sleep. And during the night, and David was given another opportunity to kill Saul. Now, however, he did not touch his life. There was a water jug and a spear next to Saul's head, and that's all they take. So again, David, he fully relied on God until the very end. And so the second period is done, but we're going to move on to the third period. And the characteristic about the third period is from Gath to Ziklag in Philistines. So Gath and Ziklag, this is a place of the Philistines. And this was about four years from B.C. 1014 to 1010. So we see here Gath and Ziklag. Gath is a place, a hometown of Goliath. And so, of course, they would not want him there. But you need to understand, how desperate is David to go to the place where he had killed their champion, right? And so number 15, Gath. David believed and relied only on God even in the midst of many tribulations and being a refugee. Thus God gave the blessing of prosperity to David and allowed him to form a large army. It's a very difficult situation in his life, and yet God has blessed him to create a large army. Now, first period, there was 400 men, according to 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. But in the second period, there were 600 men, according to the 1 Samuel 23, verse 13. And the third return, or the third uh, stage of David's life, it is a great army like the great army of God. Benjamites, the the Manasseh tribe, all these different tribes kept on going to David. And so we see that slowly, in order for David to become king of Israel, he was training him. Now going to number 15, we have Gath. It means wine press. Now Saul heard that David was in Gath again and stopped pursuing him. So David kind of sort of fools him. And lastly, we have Ziglag. And Ziglag means winding. So, winding means, you know, winding, left and right, up and down. And so, David's journey was truly a journey full of ups and downs. However, David did not forget the grace of God who chose him as king and overcame his hardships to complete the long flight from Ziglag. And so, David, he himself confessed, Psalm 31, 19, when he was recalling his memories of how difficult it was. He says, How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have performed for those who take refuge in you before the sons of mankind. So, we can see David's life at this point. So, all of us, we must, even though we're tired, 
we must understand that God is giving us a blessing that is bundled up. And so during the one year and four months that David stayed in Ziklag, a great war broke out between the Philistines of Israel. And this war resulted in God's reverse providence in which King Saul was killed and David was crowned king. So three children of Saul die. And finally, David is allowed to go up and become king. So all of this is only because God permits it. It's only because it is God's providence. So we might have our various thoughts, but all of us, we must have this absolute belief that it is all in God's will and His time. And then He will be victorious. And I pray, Lord, that this blessing of living with God at the center of our lives is upon you. Now, in conclusion, God was training David to have faith like pure gold prior to establishing him as king just as he trained Moses in the wilderness, more specifically Midian, for 40 years. And for 40 years, God was training him, protecting him, and allowing him to become the person that God wanted to use. So in the same way, in order for David, before he became king, God was training David to have faith like a pure gold. So we can see all of that through this phase of the life of David's refuge. So we can see, understand this when we look at this. Moses was separate from Pharaoh. They are two opposite ends of the same coin, right? And they're actually even family because Moses grew up in the palace. And so he ran. Moses ran away, goes to the Midian. And David was the same way. David's antagonist was Saul, and Saul tried to kill him everywhere. Saul was actually David's father-in-law. But God allows them to separate this. And so separation and perseverance will always happen in God's time. Now, at this time, we must refer back to Abraham, in which he received the commandment, leave your country, relatives, and your father's household. This is from Terah, right? Terah said, leave. And even Abraham was like, oh, I don't know. You know, do I really have to go through all these things like killing my son and whatnot? But he did. So Moses, David, they obtained the faith that God wanted or that Abraham wanted them to have. So this means we today must have that faith of Abraham. And Abraham received the covenant of the torch, right? Moses received the Sinaitic covenant. David received the Davidic covenant. What is this? All of these covenant-focused people were special in front of God. And the reason why we can see that they were special is because God made with each and every one of them a very special covenant. So this is what we need to understand. This is the lack of faith that we must have. This is the kind of faith like Abraham we should have. So all the separations, all the hardships is to show us God's love through His covenant. And so the separation of the people of the new covenant, it is a separation. Jesus' new covenant, and He also talks about the old self and the new self in Ephesians. And so in the end times, there will be another separation between the first heaven and earth and the new heaven and earth. So please believe this and remember it. 
So Job chapter 23, verse 10. But he knows the way I take when he has put me to the test. I'll come out as gold. So let's talk about three things in conclusion before we end. Now the reason why David was able to overcome 10 years of tribulation and become king. There are three things or three uh, elements within God's providence. In Romans chapter 4, verse 20 to 22, number one, we see confidence that he'll achieve victory and glory as the king of Israel. Romans 4, 20 to 22, this talks about Abraham and he was 100 years old and Sarah's womb was dead. But the moment that God promised that Abraham will have Isaac, there was a, it was credited to him as righteousness. And the same work happened to David. Now, it's truly the faith of Abraham, right? Secondly, a life of prayer that always asked God first for guidance and relied on Him even during difficult times. It was a life of prayer. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So please remember this. Now last one. A heart of love that understood the hearts of the people during the difficulties of life. So he understood them. He knew them. He, in other words, he knew the hearts of his fellow man. And that's the kind of heart that God gave to David in the wilderness. If you look in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 37, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? Just as it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. So through this, David was able to persevere through all those hard times. And so we have concluded the second and the third stages of David's life of refuge. Now lastly, let's read one verse and we will end. I'll read it. Psalm 31, verse 13 to 16. This is David's heart in all of the life of refuge. For I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side while they look to counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Let's read the last two verses. My time are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your faithfulness. Let us say amen to this. This is our Father God. And how happy and how thankful are we to have such a God. Even though we're going through difficulties, through the redemptive history books, we have found that we will be victorious. And I pray that as the victors, may we all enter through those gates of heaven. And I bless you in the name of the Lord. Now let us pray and we end. God abounding in love, grace, and mercy. Today, you have allowed us to see you and to glorify you through worship. We thank you for that. Father, especially the book three, Redemptive History Academy, this is our last lecture. And David truly had a life that was always focused on you. Father, may our... Pro May the promises you've given us, may we be firm in our belief in it. May we take Jesus and take the love of God. And may we be able to be a great king such as David. 
Father God, all of the things that you have given to us with your love and heart and mind. Father, help us to have a heart of thanksgiving as we undergo this third book graduation. May it be a time of great fruit. Please be with us and strengthen us. From the beginning of the end till the end of today's service, we entrust to you. We thank you and we pray and ask all this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.